the love affair with the streetcar was never completely extinguished in Portland. Portland, a century ago, was largely defined by the streetcar lines. There are a lot of firsts about Portland. We can be proud of our transit history. We were the largest system on the entire West Coast in, in 1891, and we also manufactured the first streetcars on the West Coast. We did a lot of things that were right on the cutting edge, right in the vanguard of the technology. Today, we have come back to that role again, where we're expanding lines, we're building streetcars. What's old is new again. Having a modern streetcar worked into the urban fabric with modern equipment was new. It was a bit of an experiment. Portland is a city of many modes. We reintroduced uh, the streetcar into a mix of autos and buses and light rail and pedestrians and bicycles. One of the challenges of the project is to how do you accommodate all those modes? When you introduce something of the scale of a streetcar, you're going to change the street, you're going to change how the street gets used, you're going to have an impact. And it's part of a model for these projects is that having people who are advocates for the community play a critical role, help give it credibility, help smooth its transition, made it better because these people really did invest a lot of themselves. We had very engaged, very committed board members. It wasn't just something you put on your resume and say, oh, I was on a board. These people were very, very active in further advancing streetcar. It's a very collegial group. We operate by consensus. It's been an opportunity that I've just loved every moment of uh, and been very privileged to be able to be a part of and work with all the great people uh, you know that have worked on streetcar now and will be working on it in the years to come. Well, the relationship between TriMet and Portland Streetcar goes back a long way and it's been a complex relationship over time. So the very beginning there was of course a development effort that was led uh, by the city of Portland to develop the streetcar and candidly I think there were a lot of people at TriMet that were pretty suspicious about whether or not a low-speed urban circulator like the Portland Streetcar would really work. We weren't exactly sure what this job was kind of due for us, so we, as an agency, were noted for dragging our feet. In fact, at one time, at noting that the first trolleys in Portland were actually pulled by horses, it, it got dubbed the donkey trolley by the TriMet people, and I have to admit that I was one of the <laughs> persons that sort of promoted that idea at one time. What is this thing? It's a kind of a donkey trial like the old stuff. What does it do? We're into moving lots of people very fast over long distances and this looks like it's something that's not part of our mission. And that was sort of the thought of TriMet for, for a good bit in the very early days because it was um, something that looked like a combination, something between a light rail and a bus. It sort of was different kind of transit than TriMet had been developing, which was longer run, uh, higher speed, urban uh, service. Um, the streetcar was very different from that. It was a circulator intended to help the development of the central city. And there were a lot of naysayers. There were some TriMet people that went over and talked to the mayor and told me, and you can't have streetcars and cars mixing with each other will never work and so on. So I, I think we've proven otherwise. They said if you guys just stay out of our federal money, you know, go forth and do good. And th that attitude obviously has changed through the years as we've worked with them more and more to integrate our, the streetcar system with the TriMet system and make sure that they, um, they support each other. We had to talk to the TriMet people and convince them that at some time this streetcar is no longer going to be something to accommodate. It is going to be part of the structure of transit in the city. It's going to be a fundamental way of getting around. It was about building a consensus that in fact this infrastructure could connect communities, could connect neighborhoods, 
and people felt that they had been engaged in the process. Neither the streetcar nor the TriMet system would be as strong without the other. And working together, they've really become, I think, a very strong transit system. The private leadership in the streetcar has been one of the most significant aspects of the streetcar. The Portland Streetcar Board and that public-private partnership, you know, really has been the, the nucleus for knitting this all together and, and making it happen. So that board uh, just has been phenomenal and my hat's off to them. Being involved in the streetcar process for the last 25 years has been the most gratifying experience I've ever had in terms of participation in the community, uh, helping build a community, being part of that, that development process. Eight years as Transportation Commissioner for the City of Portland, it was great to work with a public-private partnership that is Portland Streetcar, that includes TriMet, includes other uh, partners to take what was four miles of streetcar and turn it into 17 miles of streetcar. That includes the loop with the new streetcar pedestrian uh, max bus bridge over the Willamette River. And we did that in the context of also in those eight years of, of getting City Council to pass a streetcar master plan that shows after we build the downtown hub of streetcar, how we want to expand it out into the neighborhoods and get streetcars back into serving all the Portland neighborhoods, not just downtown. What we learned from the city, and particularly what we learned from the people that were developing the streetcar, in, and as it involved more and more of the TriMet people, is that there's another piece of the mission that the community had, and that's to develop itself. The work that we uh, put together was based on three principles and identified by three words that we thought captured the very essence of the streetcar. The first word is commitment. From a developer's perspective and from a community's perspective, the idea of the city making a commitment to this infrastructure was very important. The next word is permanence. What's important about permanence? Well, if as a developer and as small businesses come and move into the area, they'd like to know that that streetcar line is going to be there, that mode of transportation. And it's a vehicle that can't make right-hand turns onto a side street. It has to stay on the tracks. So that was important for people to say, I know it's going to be here. I know I can plan on it. I know I can, I can survive with it. The last word, catalyst, this is the very most important word of the effort that we uh, expended. If the streetcar line is in place, people felt that they could make investments in their businesses and in their properties because the commitment and the permanence signaled to them that this was going to be here in 25, 50, 75 years, and they knew that that long-term picture was going to be good for them. The local improvement districts uh, were a technique that uh, we had uh, invented, actually, because it never had been used in quite this way. To me, a significant parts about the streetcar was that the property owners have always been, for Portland, the first investors in any new line. So the demonstration of support comes from directly the property owners that are benefiting. We did the first construction manager, general contractor, or CMGC contracting for a major civil project uh, in the city of Portland. It's really a procurement process where you select a contractor based on his qualifications of safety, quality control, uh, how he sees he's going to build the job, and the team he's going to put on the job. One of the keys to the success was the CMGC process and our ability to work directly with the contractor in a collaborative mode and, and exploring new ideas of how to look at new design approaches and new approaches to the construction. It started here in the Northwest, that type of procurement, but today it's used all over the country. We had to really look at every single aspect of the job and of how to minimize the costs and minimize the impacts to the, to the street and the, the transportation environment. The track slab that we built was shallower than any track slab that had been built in the U.S. 
Uh, we used a European standard shallow rail to minimize impacts on the street, minimize impacts on utilities. Uh, this was a technique that large transit agencies uh, all over the country told us wasn't going to work and it wasn't feasible, uh, but we pushed the envelope uh, on the innovation of that with a great design team and it's worked very, very well. We tried to save the utility company money, so we worked with their engineers to come up with some real creative ways to uh, provide offset accesses and uh, manholes that come in from the side rather than from the, from the top uh, and save them spending millions of dollars and have a lot of disruption to downtown uh, relocating all their, all their lines. Whenever you relocate utilities in these old cities, uh, you find surprises. Um, and we found some really interesting surprises. Almost everywhere we went, we found old streetcar tracks and the same street where we were building new streetcar tracks. When we first put the track slab uh, through the Pearl District, there were no buildings there. And the track slab sat on a path of gravel surrounded by grass. We were building uh, the tracks cross country and, and setting the grades for the rest of the street. Similarly, on the south waterfront, when we went there, we essentially built all the streets. There were no streets there, so we built the streets. It was just uncanny how many times the design challenges came down to inches. We had to thread a needle, essentially. We had a matter of, of six inches to play with to, to fit the structure and the rails and the overhead power lines and, and, uh, and just made that squeak through. And, and um, it's just uncanny how, how many times the, these design challenges come down to holding your breath and, and, and finding those couple inches to, to make it all work. The biggest challenge was uh, crossing the Broadway Bridge. Over a hundred year old bridge, a bascule span bridge, meaning that it lifts in the center and actually moves and rolls around and perhaps uh, components of that bridge are beyond their useful life and there was a lot of concern. So we had to come up with designs that added the rail and added the overhead wire and all the various components without adding any weight to the lift span. Just on the east side of the Broadway Bridge, and there's a system of tunnels around all four legs of that intersection. Our, our tracks actually went over the top of one of these tunnels. We had a lot of challenges, which we knew we would, but we got that done. And the first streetcar project is we were really uh, confounded with how to cross the, the light rail tracks of TriMet. And we came up with an idea to re relocate their storage tracks at that terminus point for light rail. There's, there's these decorative uh, architectural features, just big columns that, that rise up and the tracks go in between. And we had to pull their tracks so tight that people were really nervous that the light rail trains would now hit these big, huge columns. It was a very, very tight fit. And so we, we had modified the columns, but we weren't sure exactly how much room we'd have. So we found an old stale maple bar laying, <laughs> laying there. And we set it on the, on the column and uh, stuck it out two and a half inches and said, if the train hits it, then we know we're too close. The inspectors called it a donut test. The donut was, was just fine, but, uh, <laughs> and even still, they, they, uh, the contractor was nervous that they, they chopped a, a small corner of the column off about this big and uh, they gave it to me as a present, so it's, it's still in my office. With a linear project like a streetcar, every three weeks you're moving to a new neighborhood, you have new neighbors, you have new issues, you have to develop new relationships, and managing those relationships and that ongoing impact in a very long, linear way, I mean, we touched, I don't know how many hundreds of businesses were adjacent to our construction over the course of all the phases of work we did. And of course we had an excellent community relations team and that managed those relationships and you know we were very aggressive about reaching out to people and, and knowing that as that it was going to be long term but it was extensive. And one of the philosophies that we had is that we wanted to make sure that we could get through construction and still remain friends with our constituents. My objective and my direction to the, to the community relations people is no surprises. None for me, no surprises for businesses, uh, and uh, we, we were very successful in doing that. We had to provide the best communication that we could possibly do 
because these constituents along the alignment would be our future sponsors and our future riders. So we wanted to create a sense of ownership and I believe we did that. I've over the years sat with uh, a number of business owners uh, that had concerns about a streetcar line going right in front of their business or a streetcar station, you know, opening up near their business, worried about its impact on their business in a negative way. And I'll never forget Michael Powell hadn't asked a question yet. And he looked at the team and he said, so I own a business along the alignment. I read an article in the Oregonian saying there were some guys talking about putting a streetcar up and down 10th and 11th, and I thought, I better figure out what's going on here. He said, how long are you going to be out on the, in front of my site? And so I countered back and said, so you mean from the beginning to the end? He goes, no, how long can I expect the heavy construction, you know, the real disturbance happened in front of my office? And I said, it should take about three weeks. I would sit down with these uh, property owners, kind of curmudgeonly group, um, and say, Go to the beach for a week. When you come back, the project will be done. And uh, your property will be worth twice what it was the day you went to the beach. But we didn't give up on the thought that we promised to do the work in three, three blocks in three weeks. The way we accomplished that was really a game changer for the industry. I said afterwards, I made good on one promise, failed on the other. We did get it done in a week. The property values didn't go up twice. They went up closer to four times. I kept telling people, I said, you know, by the time they figured, businesses figured out that we were kind of impacting what they were doing, we were out of the way. Almost every single one of those business owners that I check in with since Streetcar opened have said it has been a net positive, and in many cases, a big, big positive for them and their business. The thing I'm most proud of in running the sponsorship program is that a good majority of the current sponsors that we have today that are long-term from 2001 are still our sponsors, particularly the cars. The first day was just great to see um, this parade of people walking alongside the streetcar and the streetcar moving in the midst of really this old, um, what had been a, a rail yard. The buildings weren't here yet, so the streetcar was literally out in this you know, dirt field, um, and uh, nobody cared. We had our celebration at the Urban Plaza, and that was as far as the train went. And we uh, had a parade, a walking parade, from Portland State all the way to Northwest Portland. It was led by the uh, uh, Lions of Bonacuda Band, uh, and it was a, a terrific celebration that day. I remember walking walking the entire alignment. At that time, it was a couple of miles. Nancy and I, along with many of you, uh, walked in front of a parade of streetcars back in 2001 uh, that began the system that is now becoming this amazing complete loop. And I just want to salute the team of all of you who have worked so hard over now so many years to take a good idea and gradually make it real. We uh, developed the, what we called the Pac-Man approach, which was a small bite uh, of extensions rather than a large uh, added extension or a large project. So it was around 10 to $20 million a bite, and we would get it another half mile. So we kept doing half mile extensions every year to two years, um, eating up more of the space, and finally ended up with a four mile line down to South Waterfront. I want to underscore the great City of Portland staff in the Bureau of Transportation that I worked with on this very aggressive expansion of the streetcar system from four miles to over 17 miles. Transportation is an input, not an output. The output is, an in, is, it, is a better economy. The streetcar really unites neighborhoods and business communities and allows uh, for the development because it tells everybody what's going to happen. The developers played a major role in this. Um, look, developers in Portland were largely local um, and they were enthusiastic. They, were, they put their money on the table and their time, uh, both on the east side and, and in the central city. And a lot of people will uh, 
stigmatize developers as kind of the evil agents of change. But these people really care about the city. And uh, I think their care and concern and their commitment to this project and other projects should be noted and recorded. The planning for streetcar, even though it's owned by the city, planning for the, for the streetcar and its expansion will be in tandem with the expansion of the transit system but with this unique feature that it has a bigger payoff for development than probably anything else we do. We started building our first building and thought, can we build 50 units down here and will anybody come and what are they buying into? So we had to tell a story of trust us, trust the developer. There will be parks, there will be density eventually here, retail, shopping, great places to go and eat. And there will be a way for you to get around so you may not even need your car as you move into this neighborhood. Streetcar is a fantastic return on investment. Portland Streetcar has been a great way to get more private and other investment in the central city. For the $250 million that has been spent on streetcar, it has leveraged $4.5 billion in other investments. By picking your alignment so that you've got some built-in ridership and then planning it such that you support new development along the alignment, you set yourself up for being successful. But no, no one had any idea that we would have the kind of ridership that we had. What we had around the track were Canadian geese eating the grass, but there were no people, there were no buildings, there was nothing. So it is pretty stunning to look at the change in, in a very, very short period of time that occurred. We have billions of dollars that have been uh, constructed adjacent to the line. We're watching the development be where the city wanted it, when the city wanted it, according to its own planning guidelines. It gave people more transportation choices, not just those who live and work along the alignment, but for the entire community to be able to use it as a recreational opportunity, as a draw for tourism, as a way to show off the community. In addition to serving the development desires of the city, the streetcar is actually providing a really important transit function within downtown. Having a streetcar, you know, come to Powell's or come to any other business along the alignment or near the alignment um, is now absolutely part of the, of the fabric of the city. It isn't a designed to be a tourist attraction, but it is a tourist attraction. And visitors love it, and it, it has become iconic, the streetcar has, maybe Powell's too, iconic about what's special about the city and what makes it feel like a true urban experience. So streetcar has been not only important for building these complete neighborhoods and knitting together the east and west side, and now offering a way to move around the, the downtown. It also has been very, very helpful in getting additional investment into things like affordable housing. We went to Europe to try to find vehicles for the first phase and in a famous, among us anyway, incident, um, we were feeling a little small. We were in the, I believe, Siemens plant in Dusseldorf where they were completing a $300 million order for the German national rail system and we just wanted to buy three streetcars, please. <laughs> and John, in a moment of humility, turned to Thomas and said, how do you say Bush League in German? <laughs> Thomas answered, I guess that would be Dorfklasse. <laughs> well, Dorfklasse no more. Portland now has a Ringstrasse, and uh, that's a pretty good idea. Within two blocks of the streetcar, you could take care of every single one of life's issues, except being buried. There were hospitals, then there were clinics, then there were coffee shops, there were clothing stores, and there were car shops. But so we have to carry you someplace else to be buried. But other than that, you can do it all right here. Close the loop, which is sort of the final piece to all of the, what we've done over the last 20 years, which is the opening of the Tillicum Bridge. We have light rail going out to Milwaukee. We've got streetcar crossing the river, finally, at the Tillicum Crossing. Just an incredibly exciting time for Portlanders. The vision for the streetcar from the beginning in 1990 uh, was to, in fact, create a loop around the entire central city and connect it. 
We're, we're standing at the west end right now, the Tillicum Crossing. It's called the Bridge of the People. And needless to say, a lot of those people are going to be riding streetcar when they cross this bridge. And we're very proud of that. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is we have a legacy here. And, I, and I, our generation has a responsibility to keep this legacy continuing. Just because the loop is closed and this 30-year vision is complete doesn't mean we're, we're done. There have to be other things going on. Streetcar needs to continue to be relevant. And so I think the challenge for us is to, is to keep this going. People are getting things done around the country and there's no reason why Portland can't continue to be a leader in this department. We're not done. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do. In the next 20 years, we're gonna add something on the order of 400,000 people to this region, 260,000 jobs. That's four Hillsboroughs. I think part of that ultimately is going to require additional streetcar connections and services. I'm not daunted. I know that the need is there and I know ultimately the support will be there too as we work with our constituents. So this is a big day, payday for Portlanders. This is a big payday for the region and our commitment to transportation choices and it's a big payday for the quality of life in our central city. So bravo to all of you who've made this happen. More yet to do. We are not done building streetcar lines in Portland that will serve more neighborhoods and reach more people and open more possibilities for our citizens to get around town. We're not done.